Hello, I'm Jan Newharth, Chair and Chief Executive Officer of the Freedom Forum. Welcome to First Five Now, a Freedom Forum conversation series exploring the complex issues our First Amendment freedoms face today and featuring current newsmakers who put their freedoms into practice. Today, we join a coalition of organizations across the country for the first annual National Day of Dialogue, a series of events inviting all Americans to change our current state of division and polarization by participating in dialogue with people from different vantage points. According to the Freedom Forum's landmark survey, The First Amendment, Where America Stands, Americans know and value freedom of religion, yet remain deeply divided over the role of religion in the public square. Today, you'll hear from Freedom Forum fellow Asma Yudin and Pastor Jim Eaton, who'll engage in a dialogue about the role of the First Amendment when it comes to our nation's religious identity, the separation of church and state, and the role of faith in society. This program is brought to you by the Freedom Forum, which is continuing its year-long celebration of its 30th anniversary after its founding on July 4th, 1991, by my father, Al Newharth. Since then, the Freedom Forum has fostered First Amendment freedoms for all. Our vision is an America where everyone knows, understands, values, and defends the freedoms of religion, speech, press, assembly, and petition. And now, here's what a cross-section of Americans from our survey say about freedom of religion. Of all the the freedoms, religion is the most individual. I prefer to practice my religion, you practice yours. In my life is very important, the freedom of religion, because in this house, I have one religion, and my husband have a different religion. And my son maybe will have a third religion. Let's face it, that's kind of why the pilgrims came here. (laughs) They were escaping religious persecution. I really don't want any government uh, trying to tell me how to believe or who to believe or if I even should believe. What I find troubling with freedom of religion is when someone else uses their religion to try and control my behavior. Um, I'm a very active member of my current religious congregation. Um, (laughs) Take away freedom of religion and, you know, that's a huge chunk of my life that would be affected. Those are just a few of the voices we heard from the more than 3,000 Americans who took part in our survey, which revealed that Americans' views of the First Amendment are as diverse and divided as the country itself. One big revelation? the First Amendment remains valued and vital for nearly all Americans. And now, please welcome our moderator, John Maynard. Hello, and welcome to First Five Now. I'm John Maynard, Senior Director of Programs for the Freedom Forum. As Jen Newharth mentioned in her opening, today is the National Day of Dialogue, which is an invitation to all Americans to change our current state of division and polarization by crossing lines of differences and into real dialogue. Today, we will engage in dialogue over the topic of religion, one of our First Amendment freedoms, and we'll delve into some of the questions that divide us. What does separation of church and state really mean? Why do some Americans feel their country should be a Christian nation? And how can the First Amendment guide us through disagreements about our deepest beliefs? We are joined by two guests from diverse backgrounds, who will help us answer these questions and help understand and perhaps bridge the divide over the role of religion in the public square that our survey reveals. Jim Eaton is pastor of Mosaic Church, an intercultural congregation based in Frederick, Maryland. He also consults with organizations seeking to enhance their intercultural and multi-faith engagement in these racially and religiously polarized times. Freedom Forum fellow Asma Yudin is a religious liberty lawyer, scholar, and author. She is also Religion and Society Fellow at the Aspen Institute and a visiting law professor at Catholic University. She is the author of the 2019 book, When Islam is Not a Religion, Inside America's Fight for Religious Freedom, and the brand new book, Politics of Vulnerability, How to Heal Muslim-Christian Relations in a Post-Christian America. Today's program is made possible by generous support from the Andrew and Julie Klingenstein Family Fund, 
and from donations by the Charles C. Haynes Fund. Jim and Usma, welcome to First Five Now on this National Day of Dialogue. So the First Amendment clearly prohibits uh, an established religion. So what motivates people of faith to, to merge you know, church and state, and can you empathize with those motivations? Jim, we'll start with you. Well, thanks for having me, John and Asma. It's an honor to be here with you. I, I can, in some ways, empathize with this. I think, as I think about it, it could be religious fervor and a love for one's faith. It could be uh, some unease. Sometimes underlying things like this are demographic issues, and people are uneasy or fearful because of demographic changes. And um, as far as sympathizing with it, I do sympathize with it in the sense that I always love to see people passionate about their faith. However, I prefer to focus more on leaning into communities that are minority communities, either culturally or minority communities of faith. I was actually born in the U.S. and then moved to South Asia when I was six with my family, and they were part of a medical uh, mission hospital. So I was raised in Bangladesh in a Muslim country, and I remember seeing and even experiencing sometimes there were some extremist leaders, imams, for example, who would put pressure on people to try to uh, create oppression or dissension among the Christians in the community. And then often there would be influential people in government or in business who would step in and say, my wife was in that hospital and she experienced complications and they saved her life. They're good people. So leave them alone and allow their, their faith to flourish. And I feel the same way here in America now that I've lived here a number of years is I want to uh, be an ally and an advocate for people who are of all different faiths. Awesome. Thank you, Jim. And, I, and I, it's helpful to kind of think of this from an international perspective mm -hmm. because we do see an actual merging of church and state in a number of countries, so we can mm -hmm. see why and you know why it might be a bad idea, mm -hmm. um, but also the good intentions, as you note. Um, and so much of it does come from a good place. And I think this idea of establishing an official church and merging church and state, you know, a lot of Americans think of it as pretty scary, but it, often it is motivated by good intentions. Mm -hmm. um, this idea, as you say, passion for one's faith, this idea that we're, we've, we're onto something, this is, this is the truth, right? Mm -hmm. And we wanna share it with everyone, and we wanna make sure people aren't led astray to something that we feel deeply is a falsehood. And so it comes from that, and so in that sense, it's something that we can sympathize with because it's people being passionate about the truth and about their beliefs. But of course, in, in application, again, kind of referring to uh, the international example, and I think, unfortunately, in recent years, especially in the U.S. as well, there's yes. uh, indications that this could be a bad idea. Mm -hmm. And then beyond the theological, there's also the political element, this idea that if, you, if the government has control of religion, that's a lot of power, and you can harness it for good, uh, I think, again, there's a lot of people come to it with good intentions that you can harness it for, for to keep the peace and order. Mm -hmm. um, but you can also harness it for bad ends. I mean, once the government has something as powerful as religion mm -hmm. in, its, in its grasp, it can um, do with it what it wants, including mm -hmm. uh, really setting the wrong priorities for people and motivating them in really problematic ways. Mm -hmm. Well, that's where that actually leads to uh, my next question is, you know, some people do believe that the United States in this country is a, is a Christian nation. Mm -hmm. um, why, do you, why do you think that is? And I'll start again with you, Jim. I think there, as I ponder this, I think there are two primary reasons. One is that we have a dominant faith in America that is the Christian faith. So you go into a hotel room and there's a Gideon Bible, and Christian holidays tend to be national holidays. Um, so I think for many people, it's like a default concept in their minds. This is what I see everywhere. I see churches everywhere, so this is a Christian nation. And um, so I think that's one reason. I think a second reason has to do with a uniqueness in our founding. Not all, but some of the early founders, for example, the Puritans, came because they wanted to express their faith in a way that the leadership in England would not allow them to. And so I think these factors cause some, perhaps many Christians, to think this is a Christian nation. But I think there are at least three issues that are like caveats to this. One is the issue of indigenous peoples, the Cherokee, the Navajo, the Apache, the Iroquois. Their faiths were not really honored alongside of Christianity. So that has to be 
a part of the, the, the conversation about our country. A second thing of, is, of course, the whole issue of the Middle Passage and African Americans coming here. And although they incorporated Christianity into their experience, it was in the concept or the uh, experience of enormous suffering. And then I think the third thing is the fact that there was one pastor who moved here from the UK, and his name was Roger Williams. He came, and at first he was um, beloved by the Puritan establishment in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. However, he had a different take on religion, whereas the Massachusetts Bay Colony fused church and state. He held some doctrinal views that were different, and so he was banished from the colony, and he was sheltered and protected by Native Americans and eventually formed the Rhode Island Colony, and one of the hallmarks was he wanted to build what he called a wall of separation between church and state, and it became the first colony where people of all different faiths came and they were protected. And so our own country's history, if it's viewed in part, can cause some people to think this is a Christian nation, and whether we fuse this or not is not that important. But I think even just looking at the history of our country should give us a clearer concept of the value of the separation of church and state. I mean, I think Jim does a good job in kind of bringing in both the history piece of it and the present day experience. So as somebody who was born and raised in this country, like just you know, as a kid, I grew up in Miami, Florida. Like it's, it was pretty, uh, you know, I thought of it as a Christian nation, not in the way that I think it's talked about now, but it, exactly in the way you're talking about just Christmas and um, all the various other holidays and the decorations and the public space, right? Like every um, you know, holiday season, you see all the different symbols, which of course over time have become quite secularized, but mm. it's, it's something you see during this time and not at a time that, ha that co coincides with other religious mm -hmm. holidays. And that in itself you know, sen says something, right? Like the programming, the types of things that you're seeing um, in music and entertainment, it continuously sort of like reinforces one religion, one religious message, um, and not another. And I, and I think major strides have been made with regard to this um, in the last just like 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and the world that my kids are growing up in is really different mm -hmm. from the one that I grew up in. Um, but I think that just kind of gives it the, the sense of like there, this is the dominant religion in this mm -hmm. country. And so, you know, from there we can extrapolate this idea of America being what you know a christian nation or a majority christian nation mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and i think beyond that i mean as as a lawyer also i i think the historical element comes in for me when we're talking today about the establishment clause right we talk about the merger of church and state essentially what we're talking about is what the establishment clause was intended to prohibit and you see in certain cases that where the court is uh, for example, upholding certain very large Christian symbols in the public space. And the reasoning tends to be in some of these cases that if it's been around for a long time, then it's okay. Mm -hmm. And you have to kind of question that at times. And I mean, it makes sense. Like, I'm definitely one who, you know, advocates for the robust presence of religion in the public space. Mm -hmm. But when you kind of come at it from the historical angle, it's like, well, there's only one type of symbol that's been around for a really long time. Mm -hmm. um, and what does that mean really in terms of where we're going in terms of pluralizing the symbols and the manifestations of a variety of religions mm -hmm. in the public square? I just have a response to this. This is excellent. I really appreciate what you're sharing. I recently read a book by Abu Patel and it's called Out of Many Faiths, and he documents how America, at, you know, today we, it's common to say Judeo-Christian, but there was a period of time where that was not even accepted. It was Christian, and Jews were on the outside, Irish were on the outside, and of course, Chinese, African Americans. And then gradually through World War II, uh, the Jewish uh, group, ethnically, culturally, religiously, was brought in and he argues that now is our opportunity as a pluralistic nation to bring in Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, others. And I agree with that. I think that um, I like the benefits of being a part of a Christian culture to a certain extent, but I really value the, the aspect of a pluralistic environment where all faiths can have equal access and exercise freely. And another point that relates to the history and what you were talking about in terms of our founding era, 
is that so many of those slaves that were brought over were actually Muslim. And their presence, I mean, the founders kind of spoke uh, broadly about the protection of religion. They, they, thought, they spoke about Muslims as sort of future citizens of the United States, but the fact was there were Muslims right there in their midst, mm -hmm. but their sort of presence and their religion was made invisible by the fact that they were slaves. Mm -hmm. And I think that piece of it as well, that this isn't as new as you think, it was just yeah. essentially buried for a long time. Yes, and I think in addition to that, one of the things that's been fascinating for me as a pastor to study African-American church history is that even though most African-Americans at some point or other adopted Christianity, it was severely abridged. The slave owners uh, cut and paste their Bibles and only permitted them to speak on certain topics and much of the Bible was excluded from African-Americans. So even in their early days of, of exercising even a Christian faith, it was not a free Christian faith for them. And we touched on this a bit in the, in the first question, but how does merging uh, church and state harm the church? Uh, you know, have you seen this play out in your faith community? Jim. I think it often does have the effect of either diluting or perhaps even corrupting the church because the church is primarily defined in the New Testament in the scriptures and it's, it's very clear, for example, that Jesus said his kingdom was not of this world. And then in other parts of the New Testament, what is expanded upon is that the primary role of the church is to be an entity, an assembly is the Greek term, it's translated into English. It's an entity that is designed to function in a pluralistic environment. And so when you read the different books of the New Testament, that's how they assume the church is functioning. And so when the church functions as, say, a minority community in a pluralistic environment, that's where the church functions best. When it takes on the role of being not only the church but also the governing authority, I think it always has the effect of somehow or other diminishing the true value and the message of the church from the scriptural standpoint. It's a really interesting point the way you're talking about that because in recent years I've read um, you know, various writings by influential Christian leaders in this country. For example, Russell Moore in a recent book kind of talks about like how Christianity was strange and it's always meant to be strange, mm -hmm. which is interesting because that's an actual tradition in the, in the Muslim tradition as well. That, mm -hmm. you know, the people quote the prophet that we were, we came as, you know, as strangers and we will mm -hmm. always be strangers. Um, and so the sort of, an, it's a, it's a re-embracing it seems or mm -hmm. a way of sort of making sense of where Christians are right now in this country and understanding that being authentic to the religion might actually require that. And that there was something mm -hmm. that went wrong uh, when they became not strange, when they became too familiar, right? Mm -hmm. When they became uh, too dominant. Um, I think for, for me, and just, you know, in, things, in terms of thinking about how it harms the church, in the sense, of course, thinking of church broadly as, as religion, um, the international example proves instructive again. Mm -hmm. In places where there is, for example, in Muslim majority, in some Muslim majority states, not all of them, um, and not even a majority of them, and I feel the need to kind of clarify that because mm -hmm. I think there's an assumption there. Um, but in those Muslim majority states where there is this submerging, Ultimately, the, the people who are most persecuted and who suffer the most tend to be Muslims themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's because once you kind of give government control of religion, well, what religion, right? Which version of it? There's so much of what we believe and in, in our idea and expression of faith is constantly changing. Mm -hmm. um, it takes so many different forms. It evolves as we evolve. But the government, when, you have, when you're in control of it, there's like one version, mm -hmm. and that is the version, right? That is Islam or that is Christianity. And dissent is essentially not something that they can tolerate mm -hmm. because it becomes something that's threatening, mm -hmm. not just religiously or spiritually now, but also politically because mm -hmm. it's a government thing, right? Um, and so you see really extreme examples about, of this in various parts of the world mm -hmm. uh, where people are, I mean, essentially becomes a life or death issue where mm -hmm. people are essentially being killed mm -hmm. or imprisoned because they expressed a version of the religion that doesn't mm -hmm. comport with the government's version. Um, I think that's uh, a huge, huge problem with, in terms mm -hmm. of uh, mm -hmm. establishment of religion and the impact it has on, on the faith itself. Um, and I think the other, another part of it is just like what happens, like the, what are the, how does it get instrumentalized, right? So in the abroad, often we're thinking about sort of extreme manifestations of it, the way it sort of mutates because mm -hmm. now that it's become mm -hmm. a political tool, which it inevitably will become, 
um, if the government's in control, mm -hmm. then it can suddenly be used to justify all kinds of violence, uh, mm -hmm. not just with the citizens of the state mm -hmm. itself, but beyond that as well. And I think in the US context, I think we've seen both, you know, many, many different types of versions of this, but I think there's also a fear that if it becomes a government affiliated religion, that it, may be, it might actually water down, kind of what you were saying, diluting mm -hmm. um, the specialness, um, the difference of the faith itself, and make it sort of a common denominator for, mm -hmm. you know, the, the political, you know, citizens of the state, um, which then kind of robs it of its, again, its authenticity. Yes, I agree. And I think, biblically speaking, the primary attributes that, that God is calling from the church is righteousness, compassion, uh, care for those who are marginalized, uh, love. And so when the church gets too fused with the state, you can have situations like January 6th, where there were Christian symbols all over the U.S. Capitol. But many of us who are Christ followers were appalled at what was happening because sometimes in our history particularly racism has been and white supremacy has been fused with the church and the church has very often been complicit with that and so I think that the more there is a continued wall of separation again like we're both saying we're not saying to keep faith out of the public square it certainly should flourish but to have it in such a way that the church is the church, the synagogue is the synagogue, the mosque is the mosque, and keep it separate from the governing affairs it does t tend, I think, to keep, in the case of Christianity, what the Christian teachings are supposed to prioritize are more visible and more clear to the public. Asma, can you expand on how merging church and state might harm citizens of the state? Yes, I can. Unfortunately, there's one too many examples, real life examples from from across the world. Um, I think definitely part of U.S. history, throughout European history, and in other parts of the world, even today, where we see people um, again facing a, a choice between life and death. Um, sometimes we, without, without without even knowing, because it's really kind of again once you've given government control over religion, you don't really know how that's going to be used. You don't know how private citizens are also going to attempt to take things into their own hands. Um, so you see this, for example, in, in Pakistan. And it is, I mean, Pakistan is where my family is from. My parents were, were born there. And um, you see plenty of examples it, throughout. Unfortunately, it's, you know, it's recent history. It was founded on the basis of religious pluralism. Um, and religious peace, especially you know, after it became segregated um, from uh, from India, it was a place of refuge for Muslims, but the vision was that it would be a place of refuge for all religions. Mm -hmm. And where it's at right now is again a total and absolute you know, product of its merging with the state. And you, what you see is you um, see people, again, in some, a lot of cases you see private citizens taking the law into their own hands because it's something that has approval from the government. And so you could be a business, you could just have someone who's a business rival mm -hmm. and you could just basically accuse them of blasphemy. Mm -hmm. And there's no real way of proving or disproving that. And once you've mm -hmm. accused them of blasphemy, the government gets involved and you mm -hmm. see people being punished, their, mm -hmm. their businesses being taken away from them, uh, they're put in, being put uh, in jail. Um, and sometimes, you know, dealing with a lot of violence, even against sort of private citizens who decide that this is something that they can become enraged by. Mm -hmm. Um, and blasphemy is so difficult to, to prove or disprove because if you repeat it, <laughs> then you also are a blasphemer. Mm -hmm. And so you have cases in Pakistan where you even have lawyers, like human rights lawyers in court trying to defend people who have been accused of blasphemy who were literally gunned down in court. Mm -hmm. uh, you see the, the former governor of the Punjab province, you know, Salman Tassir, who was literally killed by his own bodyguard mm -hmm. um, because he, he sought to amend the blasphemy laws. Mm -hmm. Um, so things get bad. There's lots of, of bloodshed. Um, you see this not just in Pakistan, but a number of other countries as well. Um, and I think that is, to me, the clearest example of why it's a bad idea. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I think here in, in this country, one of the things that uh, my wife and I have experienced is we have a number of friends here in the DMV who are um, American Muslims. They're Pakistani Americans. Uh, most of them, some Indian Americans as well. And we, after the election, I started up a friendship with a man who's a Pakistani American, and we had an idea to have gatherings in his home. And so we'd have a 
uh, catered in dinner and there'd be 20 or 30 guests and we were there and we just began to talk about concerns and what are the fears and a lot of them revolved around cultural, ethnic, racial things, but there were faith, religious overlaps. And so there were times in the conversation where they would describe, for example, something that they would experience that was adverse, it was intolerant. And there was uh, some kind of a symbol or a communication that this is part of that person's Christianity as to why they would mistreat a Muslim. And so my wife and I were then saying, this, we're so sorry you've experienced this. Here's what the truth of Christianity actually teaches, that you have compassion for others, that you want to put yourself in the place of others. There should be empathy. And there was um, a visible emotional uh, reaction going on in the living room because people were moved by that. And I, I think sometimes there is overlap between religion and culture, but I think that there are cases and situations here in America where if people don't think clearly about how their actions, their words, by trying to fuse Christianity and the state together can really harm people of other faiths and of other cultures. Yeah, I mean, I think that's actually a really good point. I mean, you, you think you're referring to unintentional examples, mm -hmm. but I, a lot of my research actually looks at intentional mm -hmm. examples. Um, you know, I recently published a book where I look at not just at the phenomenon of what's happening with people who are very concretely opposing mm -hmm. the religious freedom rights of American Muslims, mm -hmm. but then also probes the question of why are they doing this? Mm -hmm. And a lot of it comes from, and, and I take the approach of like, you know, a lot of this is, is really about uh, people's fears and anxieties related to the changes happening in this country. Mm -hmm. and, and early on today, you did refer to demographic changes mm -hmm. and how that relates to this. But also, you know, there's a distinction to be made by people who, people who are feeling very valid fears, I think, mm -hmm. um, and reacting in very human ways versus people that I think we all sort of refer to, the popular culture refers to as, as, as a Christian nationalist. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, as a side note, I think that that phrase is used sometimes too broadly mm -hmm. to even include people who are not what I th would define as a as a nationalist. But people who are like that in, a, in an attempt to kind of defend their space um, mm -hmm. in this country and and to prioritize and give mm -hmm. dominance to to their religion um, for often political goals, I should say, not necessarily mm -hmm. religious goals. Part of that is to resist the rights of other religious groups mm -hmm. because that's seen as threatening. Mm -hmm. And so absolutely that the establishment of, of a religion in that sense where it's essentially it, this country is thought of as a Christian nation in very sort of concrete, mm -hmm. legal, and political ways can inspire people to then take away rights uh, or seek to take away rights from other people. I think you're exactly right. I think as a pastor, we have I've experienced... Um, and our church has experienced some adverse circumstances over the past two or three years because we are committed to not only speaking for those uh, who are experiencing personal racism, but also to, to investigate and speak out against systemic racism, and then also to stand in to serve uh, and to, to bless people of other faiths. And so, for example, when the, the massacre occurred in Christchurch, New Zealand, I was at... Uh, one of the largest mosques here in the D.C. area and stood there to say we're standing in solidarity with you. And then when the massacre occurred in Sri Lanka, just a few weeks later, a number of our Muslim friends came to our service to say we're standing in solidarity with you. And so I think that when you have these kinds of circumstances, what you want to resist is the impulse that are often threads underneath the surface and Christian nationalism is one of them. The, some of the myths in our national history are not actually true, and they don't actually accord with Scripture. So in our church context, we've actually lost a number of people because of the posture we're taking on the issues of race and on the issues of multi-faith. But I think it's worthwhile, and I think it's essential to stand in this time for not only what uh, is decent and human, but speaking as a Christian, what I believe is also a Christian response. So on this National Day of Dialogue, you know, we've engaged in a, in a hard conversation about, about separation of church and state. And um, I'm wondering, how, how do you have these hard conversations with your faith community? And you know, how can the First Amendment inform or, or guide these conversations? And I'll start with you, Jim. Well, my primary avenue of conversation in my faith community is to walk through 
the Word of God, walk people through the scriptural teachings, because I think that is, we're, we're coming like, I, I was listening to a conversation online where Asma said this, a soft place to have a hard conversation, and I think that's a good way to put it. I try with the people under my care, under my shepherding, to find the ways to meet them in a place where they can, we have commonality. And so when we're going into the scripture, that's where we have commonality. But then also to say, have you considered this scripture? For example, in the New Testament, there's a passage in 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16 that says, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it, but do this in a gentle and respectful way. And so what this speaks of is our faith should primarily be operative in a civil way, in a compassionate way. You don't back away from truth, but you're not abrasive with it. You don't coerce with it. You always treat others with great care and great respect and honor. And so when you use scripture that way, uh, sometimes people are more receptive and I've seen people change in their posture and their perspectives. Other times people will stiffen in their attitude and may actually walk away from the table. But that's the approach. And I think the First Amendment is a very strong thing in our nation, particularly with, with Christians who will say, I'm a patriotic Christian, I'm a strong American, um, to say, well, this is, what, this is the true teaching of the First Amendment, and this is how we want to welcome people of other faiths and stand with them in their place of need. Totally agree with that, Jim. Um, and when you say, you know, having hard conversations in soft places, it's really... You know, I took the phrase actually from Brene Brown, who's mm -hmm. known well for her work on vulnerability. Mm -hmm. But I think what struck me the most and why I incorporated her work into mine is because anytime I have these conversations, I think of the person who's sitting with me as a person, mm -hmm. <laughs> which unfortunately that's becoming a pretty rare thing in a mm -hmm. lot of conversations that Americans are having or avoiding, I should say, mm -hmm. um, in, in, this day in um, this day and age. Um, but I just... I'm like, you're a person, you have your own fears and anxieties, mm -hmm. and, and that's not something that I need to start with the premise that that's somehow wrong or evil mm -hmm. or, or it's something I should demonize. Um, but I'm just going to take you from you know, where, you, where you're mm -hmm. at. Um, and so in terms of those conversations, the First Amendment for me, especially as a lawyer and somebody who studies and writes about the law, has been central to that conversation because so much of free speech and religious liberty, um, really core parts of the First Amendment, um, have become so politicized that it's almost impossible to talk about the issues from almost any other perspective. Like if you take a cultural or political or other mm -hmm. lens, it's like, well, people find space to disagree mm -hmm. and to to stop you short in whatever argument you're trying to make. But the legal angle for me has always added so much clarity. Um, mm -hmm. If you can just think about the legal standard, if you can think about the different scenarios that has been presented in the context of cases, mm -hmm. Uh, that helps you to kind of navigate the differences and not have this sort of really broad idea of what is right and wrong, but okay, well, how does that work in the real world? Mm -hmm, Let's mm -hmm. consider actual real world cases. Mm -hmm. um, and so in terms of conversations with my own faith community, on the one hand, you know, I did a lot of extensive you know, research on blasphemy laws, as I've talked about throughout this interview, whether it's in Pakistan or Indonesia or Egypt or, or elsewhere. Um, and, you know, this, this even today, you see incidences, right? Like cartoons of the prophet in, the, in a Danish uh, newspaper, and and the response to that, and how you know coming at it from a free speech perspective can be. Um, you have to be careful even with the way you talk about that because there's like a sort of a very. I mean, the free speech clause is very American. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's no other place in the mm -hmm. world that kind of protects speech to that extent. Um, and not to kind of come at it as, again, sort of this American imperialist sort of perspective was like, the, you know, mm -hmm. the, the American Constitution has it right and we'll mm -hmm. teach others. But just to see what the benefits of that are. And if you kind of apply that same approach to offensive speech, um, what, you know, there, how do we determine what's offensive, right? And it becomes so subjective that it can then lead to, and who gets to decide, right? Who's, what's offensive? We're talking about you know, the government's involvement, you know, where does this really take us? Mm -hmm. And so to being sort of rational and kind of getting through, um, you know, or I should say logical and working through a number of different sort of fact scenarios, I think is really helpful for people. Um, and then there's also just the other part of it, right? The multi-faith, the bridge building mm -hmm. piece of this, you know, most of our Supreme Court cases don't involve Muslims or religious mm -hmm. minorities, they involve Christians, um, especially mm -hmm. most more recently. And they are really political and they're hot button issues. And 
again, it's, it's very easy to get upset, um, especially in a context where people are arguing so passionately mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. America being a Christian nation. Um, a lot of these cases, a lot, a lot of these wins can be seen as a win for a Christian nation or the mm -hmm. Christian dominance. And it's important for me to just be like, well, let's just take a step back and look at what the actual decision said and, and how the specifics of that opinion can ultimately benefit a wide diversity of people. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation, but we have run out of time. Uh, Jim and Usma, thank you for all your valuable insights and for joining us today on First Five Now. And to all our viewers, we hope you'll share your thoughts about today's program via social media at the addresses listed below. And the Freedom Forum will be posting a recording of this program on the Freedom Forum YouTube page where you can post comments. And we'll hope you'll tune in to the next episode of First Five Now on Thursday, February 10th at 2 p.m. for a discussion about the history of free speech, not just in the United States, but across the globe. We'll be joined by author Jacob Misangama. We'll talk about his new book, Free Speech, A History from Socrates to Social Media. I'm John Maynard. Thank you for joining us.